Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I know, um, another digital lecture, here we are. You may notice there's now a me in the corner. I don't know if that's gonna make me feel more or less awkward, I guess we'll have to see, um, but welcome. So today, we're gonna start a new chapter. Unit H is gas exchange in mammals. So the lungs, how we breathe. Um, we talked about hemoglobin, how it carries oxygen, how it carries CO2, and now how that stuff gets in our bodies. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's see. Ooh. Ooh. So first of all, if you have access to a printer at all, you probably can get away with not printing the full notes packet. The big, big, big emphasis here is it's like another anatomy chapter, kind of like the heart. So you have to know like where the structures are, like what kind of cells are there. So we do have this big, beautiful, nice, complete note packet that is obviously big, beautiful, and nice, but mm, like medium necessary. It's probably not too, too hard to take like handwritten notes on this one. But what I would recommend printing if you have any capability to are the diagrams. I think, I think this is an old copy, um, but labeling these diagrams as we go is probably going to be the most helpful thing out of everything. So get situated. Um, but this is kind of like an anatomy chapter. So structures, you know, where's their cartilage, where is their smooth muscle and where those things are is really the only thing, like the big thing that we're looking at for this chapter. Let me make sure my pen, I got a fancy fancy pen. Just make sure my pen, pen looks good. Okay. All right. Basics. How we get to the lungs. We got our nose, our pharynx is the back of your throat. So if you like stuck your finger in your mouth, you'd touch your pharynx. Um, larynx is just below that. It's also your voice box. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, trachea is in your chest. Big cartilage tube. That's going to branch into bronchi, bronchi go to your lungs. So it's just a bunch of tubes to get air to your lungs. Um, oh, just to kind of remind us. So we've done the heart and everything. So this kind of brings us to like the alveoli. These capillaries is where we're getting oxygenated when we said before. I've got a 19 pound cat that's drinking water. Um, he's so big. Um, anyway. So we've kind of talked about how capillaries gas exchange. So these capillaries right here is where that happens. So this is when we say, you know, it goes to the lungs and gets oxygenated. That's what we're talking about now. Ooh, okay. So the respiratory system, whole system is that, which does gas exchange. So you have oxygen to do, oh, I'm in the way, uh, cell respiration. So big system respiration, gives you the gas for cell respiration. Um, so we have internal and external gas exchange. External is with the external environment. <sighs> Breathing. Internal is going to be when, you know, your hemoglobin drops off oxygen, picks up CO2, all that jazz. So is it inside or outside? Your respiratory organs. We've got your nose and your mouth. You breathe in through those. Um, like I said, the pharynx is the back of your throat. Um, it connects the oral and the nasal passageway. So it's where everything kind of combines in the back of your throat. Your epiglottis, it's in purple here. Um, it's that little flap that stops food from getting into your lungs. So when it's like, oh, that went down the wrong pipe, your epiglottis might've messed up. Uh, so it covers the opening of the larynx. So when you swallow, it kind of forces that flap down and that's how food doesn't get into your lungs. I was going somewhere with that, doesn't matter. Okay, if we keep going, larynx is in the front here. It's your voice box. So like, uh, uh right in there. Um, and it's continuous with the trachea. So like the larynx, and then once it gets into your actual like chest cavity, it's your trachea, but it's the same tube. It's made of pretty much the same thing. Um, and then the bronchi branch into your two lungs. So just a continuation of that tube that's going to get narrower and narrower and narrower. Whew, okay, so the bronchi branch into smaller bronchi branch into smaller, kind of like veins and venules and arteries and arterioles. Branch, 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 bronchioles. 
bronchioles, once you get to the super tiniest, they terminate or end in alveoli that are these small little air sacs surrounded by capillaries. So they literally are little like balloons that fill and, you know, deflate with oxygen and CO2. Here's a diagram. I've blacked out some things we don't need to know. So we've got trachea, branches into bronchi, branches into bronchioles, bronchioles, bronchioles. We'll talk about the different bronchioles in a second. And then at the very, very end of that chain would be alveoli. Huh, there they are. So terminal bronchioles and then alveoli do really look like little balloons. So there are these little like balloon air sacs that are covered in a web of capillaries. And that membrane between capillary and alveoli is where the blood is going to drop off CO2 to exhale. <sighs> and the air in the lungs, the oxygen is going to diffuse in. So that's where, you know, blood becomes oxygenated in the lungs. Um, the conducting zone is another word for everything that is conducting the air to the respiratory zone, which is the alveoli. So it's kind of or well, within the lungs. So trachea down, tubes that keep branching, branching, branching. That helps to filter, humidify, warm the air coming in. So if you've ever been like up north during the winter when the air is really dry and really cold, it hurts to breathe. Humid, warm air is the best air to breathe. Okay, and then the respiratory zone is where gas exchange actually happens. It's going to be the very tiniest bronchioles that are the respiratory bronchioles. Kind of makes sense when you think about it. And then those terminate in your alveoli, little air sacs. Um, okay, so we'll, here, I'm gonna make, an, I'll make a new slide real quick. I just want to cover this super quick. So if we're keeping track, blood is gonna come in. Eh. Oxygen is gonna come in through the nose or mouth. This isn't too bad. Nose and mouth, pharynx, larynx, larynx, <laughs> trachea, bronchi, bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi. Bronchioles, alveoli, in case we're keeping track. So um, lots of names, lots of like, oh, we have to remember all these names. Yeah, but that's, you just kind of have to know the pathway. So not too crazy, I would hope. Okay, so starting at the top again. Um, so your nasal cavity, your air is going to pass through your nostrils, connects to the pharynx in the back. The floor of your nasal cavity or your sinus cavity is formed by the hard palate, which is the roof of your mouth. Eh, eh, eh. You're touch it. You can touch it with your tongue. Um, this is so weird. Um, so it's the bottom of your nasal cavity. It's lined with ciliated cells and goblet cells. So ciliated, we've talked about cilia little finger-like extensions. It's going to help sweep mucus, debris, dust, kind of all this stuff down into your pharynx so you swallow it. Gross. Okay, so some fancy cell names. I give this two stars. So first we have ciliated columnar epithelial cells. Big name, nothing too fancy. Ciliated has cilia. Columnar Columnar refers to their shape. They're just long and skinny. Columns. And then remember, epithelium is just the lining of things. So cells that are lining something, long, skinny shape with cilia. That uh, is going to stop some microbes and debris from getting too far. Your, you know, the hairs in your nose and your mucus and everything catches a lot of gunk before it gets to your lungs. Pushes mucus along the surface up until you swallow it. The next one is our, our squamous cells. Squamous just means flat. So in this case, we could say that squamous epithelium cells are just not ciliated. They don't have, you know, these little, little hairs. None of that. They're just flat. So squamous literally like means flat. Fancy word for not ciliated. And then we have the occasional goblet cells. 
goblet cells are called goblet cells because of the shape, which I think is on the next slide. Um, and they secrete mucus. So they've got lots of Golgi bodies. They're lots of like mitochondria, lots of ATP because they're secreting mucus. I'm just going to, you know, the cilia help push the mucus and all the gunk up your throat and then down into your esophagus and you swallow it. Oh, there's the shape. So see, it's shaped kind of like a goblet of sorts. Yeah. Mm, that's a goblet. Um, so secrete mucus. Uh, mucus is mostly water and some mucin. Mucin is a slimy protein with some other stuff mixed in. So lots of Golgi apparati, apparatus eye, lots of Golgi bodies, um, lots of exocytosis. Exocytosis is an active process, so a good amount of mitochondria, things like that. So they're kind of scattered throughout these ciliated cells, you know, every so often to keep everything slimy. Here are some real pictures. So you can see the cilia here. The air is kind of blowing the cilia in the wind. Um, we don't really need to worry about pseudo. -na -na. Oh, and there's red blood cells. So you can kind of see how the blood connects, but meh. Yeah. Goblet cells, they have that different shape and they're kind of scattered throughout. That was a cat. Um, and then there's some more cilia. So fairly distinct when you're looking at a picture. Oh, okay, here's another picture. So goblet cells, pretty easy to distinguish because they've got that like wine glass type shape. Okay, moving on. So your pharynx is the back of your throat. So it connects right here. It's highlighted in green. Um, again, we've got the epiglottis. It's covered by me, darn it, but it's right here. Can I move me? All right. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that back. Um, so the epiglottis is right here. It's going to switch back and forth. Can you get me back? And we're back. Okay. Um, can I move myself? I can't. Maybe I'll be up here over like the objectives. That's not ideal. Oh. There we go. That works. Okay. So moving back now. So epiglottis is there. Um, pharynx, again, more squamous, more ciliated epithelium, goblet cells, so on and so forth. Then your larynx is your voice box. It's in the front, so I'm not going to do it again, but like right here. Um, vocalizations, that's how we talk. Voice box helps open your airway. Um, again, the epiglottis, the switching mechanism, food or air, food or air. Um, if we're looking at this diagram, so the larynx is this like boxy shape up here, and then it's going to lead into the trachea, and then primary bronchi, bronchi, and then eventually, you know, bronchioles too. So this is all just branches of one tube that's going to get smaller and thinner and smaller and thinner and smaller and thinner until we get to the very end. All right, so then trachea, your windpipe. It's more like the bottom of your neck and actually in your chest cavity. So it's below your larynx. Once it gets to the lungs, it's going to separate left or right for the bronchi. Um, it's got these C-shaped rings, so not like a complete circle, but like, you know, C-shaped rings of hyaline cartilage. It's just a type of cartilage. We're not too worried about it. You know, cartilage is in your ear, in your nose. So it's flexible, but it's still relatively strong. So that's important because, you know, you don't want to snap your windpipe. You want to be able to, like, move your neck. If, you know, you had something pushing against your neck, it's not going to break anything. So it's flexible for bending and not breaking, but it's also strong enough that it's going to stay open. You know, if you lie on your back, you're still breathing. So it holds it open without being, like, super rigid. Um, trachea still has goblet cells. Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle. Um, so it can kind of contract or widen. So, you know, sometimes that smooth muscle can contract and that's when you feel tight in the chest or if someone, if you're having like an asthma attack or something like that. 
and ciliated cells. Yeah. Okay. And ciliated cells, so more cilia. Again, we're trying to keep as much debris from getting into the lungs as possible. All right. So pictures. We've got a real picture and then a nice diagram. Um, so notice that cartilage, it always has these little dots in it. Cartilage is here too. So it's always going to have that kind of dense, darker color, lots of little dots. Um, identifying from pictures is a big thing that we'll have to be able to do. Um, this is smooth muscle. So smooth muscle typically looks like that too. And then if we're looking at the actual picture, if we zoomed in on this, we could see that these are cilia, but it's just kind of fuzzy in there. So it's epithelium and then blood vessels running throughout because blood vessels run everywhere in your body. Okay, so after the trachea, we've got bronchi, bronchioles. Um, trachea branches off into two main bronchi, and then those are going to keep branching until you get to the alveoli. All right, bronchi. So the bronchi are always wavy. Wavy edges. So wavy edges, um, again, we do have these chunks of cartilage. You can't really see the dots in this particular picture, but stains a different color, kind of look, it looks, you know, distinct. So oh, I need to fix that. Okay, so that arrow should actually be doing this. So it's going to the blue there. Yeah, well, that circle can stay. Can I agree? Nope. Okay. So wavy edges, we've got the circles, um, but again, always the wavy edge. Okay, and then the smooth muscle has that kind of like sheets kind of layered on top of it look. Right there in the picture, it's, or the like the real picture, it's just kind of a lighter layer. Under, I'll do green. Right, so then bronchi and bronchioles. Um, we don't have to know all these names per necessarily. So trachea, bronchi. So here, trachea, bronchi. Not too worried about it. Bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, and then respiratory bronchioles are the tiniest ones. They're the ones that are connected to the respiratory surface, which is the alveoli. So I guess pretty much everything except, except, except segmental bronchus. Um, okay, so then alveoli, again, air sacs covered in like a spider web looking casing of capillaries, and that's where those gases are going to diffuse across those membranes to drop off CO2 to be exhaled, pick up the oxygen that's being inhaled. So they're hollow air sacs. You can picture them like balloons. At the end of respiratory bronchioles, um, you have over 300 million alveoli in your lungs. So this comes back to an idea that we've seen many a time before, surface area. Lots of little alveoli is better than a few big ones. Surface area, surface area, surface area. Um, total surface area is around 750 square feet. I think that's both lungs. Huge surface area for gas exchange. Um, the gases are diffusing. So remember back to our diffusion chapter, Increasing surface area is going to increase diffusion rate. Um, very, very thin walls, half a micrometer, very elastic. Again, like a balloon. You don't want them popping because they are going to be stretching full of air and contracting as they empty. So really like little stretchy balloons, very, very thin, stretchy balloons because you have gases diffusing across them. Oh, here's a picture. Um, this is on the diagram sheet. So terminal bronchioles are like the beginning of the branch. Respiratory bronchioles are going to be the tiniest, tiniest branch. And then alveoli. Um, they won't really ask you about bronchioles in a diagram or say like, is this a terminal or a respiratory bronchiole? But they could, oh, I'm sorry. Respiratory bronchioles are actually these at the very, very end over here. Respiratory bronchioles are over here. Um, so they're not really going to give you a diagram and say, like, which one is which? But they could say, you know, what is that right there next to the alveoli that the alveoli are attached to? 
respiratory bronchioles. And then the alveoli are the little, looks like a grenade in that picture. All right, so some pictures. Um, so we've got ciliated cells, check, smooth muscle, check. Um, a lot of times in pictures and like real pictures too, alveoli are going to look like negative space when you're looking at cross sections. So like these big like circular chunks of empty going to be alveoli. Um, so this is like an up and down and then this is an all the way through again with the wavy edges. But it really just depends, you know, is there cartilage, is there a ton of muscle or is there not a whole lot and then some alveoli. Um, one of your activities later in the week will have to do with pictures too. Oh, okay. So alveoli again, the empty space. And then we do have, if you look closely at a bronchial, you do have a wave of smooth muscle. Um, bronchi and bronchioles can look very similar. The biggest difference is going to be the bronchi have cartilage and bronchioles do not. So I'll write bronchioles. They're too small. Okay. Um, here's an SEM, which we've talked about, scanning electron microscope. So again, it looks like foam, almost like very porous foam, empty space. Um, we're not super worried about the alveolar sac or the alveolar duct, but it's just going to be kind of like what leads into your alveoli. Looks like a bunch of grapes. And then this one right here shows the capillaries as well. Okay, another picture. So alveoli, respiratory bronchioles. Um, again, they can have that wavy kind of edge and sometimes they're not always like super perfectly circular either. And then lots of negative space, lots of empty white. That's the alveoli. Ooh, I'm gonna give this three stars. If you, four stars. <laughs> um, if you do not have the notes printed out and you like copy one single thing from this PowerPoint, this is probably going to be it. What's where is the big point. So trachea, you've got one, 1 1.8 centimeters. So not super big, but not super small either. In diameter, yes, cartilage, yes, goblet cells, yes, smooth muscle cells, yes, ciliated cells. And then as you get smaller, you have less things. So bronchi, a little bit smaller, still has everything though, because we're going to both lungs. Terminal bronchioles, quite a bit smaller, so like 10%. Um, no cartilage, just cartilage is too big. No goblet cells. When you have a really tiny tube, you don't want to be secreting mucus into it. It's really easy for mucus to clog a tube when it's only a millimeter in diameter, so no more goblet cells. Um, it does still have smooth muscle, so when, you're, when someone's having an asthma attack or something like that, that muscle can still like and make it harder to breathe. Um, and it does still have ciliated cells. So if there is dust or debris that's getting into your bronchioles, there's still cilia to try to sweep it up, but you're not clogging up the cilia with mucus at that point when it's that small. So then respiratory bronchioles are about half that size. Now we're too small for the smooth muscle. Maybe we have a few ciliated cells, but not a whole lot. These are really just tiny, tiny, tiny tubes to get the air through. Um, alveoli, you've got a bunch of them. Very, very thin. This is diameter. So again, if the wall is half a micrometer wide, that means that the walls are only one. So that's 249 micrometers diameter of empty space. So it is mostly empty space. No room for anything, but it is the site of gas exchange. All right. Oh, look at that gif. Um, so alveolar walls, single layer, single layer of epithelium, like we said, like half a micrometer, super, super thin, tiny, covered in capillaries. The respiratory membrane is where alveoli wall meets capillary wall. It's the wall, the walls that gases are diffusing through. Um, and then we do have things like alveolar pores as well. 
And that's going to let things like macrophages and white blood cells and stuff into the alveoli to fight, you know, infections or something like that. So you do have pores that will let bigger things through. This is going to become important when we talk about smoking, which is the next part of this, when we talk about smoking. So let's see if we can wait for the jet to restart. GIF. Oh, okay. So CO2 goes out, oxygen goes in. And it's red now. Okay. Less exciting than I thought. All right. Um, that respiratory membrane is also called the air-blood barrier. It's the barrier between the air and the blood. Oxygen from the air that you're breathing diffuses into your red blood cells. Carbon dioxide waste diffuses out of your red blood cells, and then you exhale it. Another picture. So we've got pulmonary arteriole. So it's going in blue. Ah, it gets to the alveoli. I guess the air blood barrier is about there. Oh, it's oxygenated now. And then it flows back to the heart via eventually the pulmonary vein. Here's another picture. Um, so we don't need to know the types of the cells, but so this is epithelium. So that one layer of cells, um, alveoli, you know, you've got red blood cells passing through those. And we do have some macrophages hanging out. If something gets all the way to your alveoli, sometimes you want to have some macrophages, some white blood cells ready to nip that right in the bud. Um, okay, and red blood cell capillary, and we're showing the gases again. A lot of detail in this picture that you don't necessarily need, but it gives a good, like, comprehensive picture, I think. Ooh, so some adaptations of the gas exchange system um, cleans the air. All that mucus and all those cilia really help to stop things from getting into your lungs. Um, warm air upping temperature increases diffusion. So warm air is going to diffuse faster, maximizing surface area while minimizing distance. So we have like half a micrometer, two super thin membranes, you know, as little distance as possible for those gases to diffuse to keep it efficient. Um, and concentration gradients. You know, everything is going to flow from a high concentration to a low concentration. So keeping that in check so that the oxygen keeps flowing in and the CO2 keeps flowing out is really important. Okay, so last thing is when you're actually breathing. Oh, I drew this out earlier. So when you inhale, the air goes through your trachea, your bronchi, terminary bronchial, terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, and then finally your alveoli. So just tubes, 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 air sacs. Um, so how do you breathe? We've got that diaphragm, or you have your diaphragm underneath your lungs. Um, I'm not going to get up, but if you go like, mm, I will, right under, mm, right under your ribs, you've got this thin sheet of muscle called your diaphragm. It is going to push down, or I guess push up and relax, and push up and relax, and that's going to create a pressure gradient that helps you breathe. When you have the hiccups, it's your diaphragm spasming. So that sheet of muscle, you know, when you hiccup. Okay, take a second. Become hyper aware of your breathing. I keep looking at the microphone. Um, hyper aware of your breathing. Is that how you do ASMR? Okay. So when you inhale, your diaphragm contracts and moves down. So if this is your diaphragm and moves down, when your diaphragm moves down, that's going to create more room for your lungs to expand, you know, more room for your lungs to expand. We're increasing volume. It's going to decrease the pressure in your lungs. When you take physics, probably maybe chemistry, it'll talk about how volume and pressure are inversely proportionate. So increasing volume decreases pressure. Um, air flows, gases flow towards a negative pressure. So that will keep oxygen flowing into your lungs. Um, yeah, so it allows oxygen or gas to flow into your lungs. So lungs expand, increase in volume, decrease in pressure, negative pressure in the lungs. Air flows from high to low, so air will flow into your lungs. So... You exhale, 
your diaphragm relaxes, moves back up. That's going to create less space for your lungs, increasing the pressure in your lungs to push the air out. Lungs decrease, deflate, decrease in volume, increase in pressure, and that's going to push air towards the lower pressure outside. And you exhale, hopefully carbon dioxide. Um, if you didn't print the notes, another thing I would make sure to write down, inhalation versus exhalation, volume, or so where the diaphragm is, pretty much everything I put in caps and bold, which makes sense, where the diaphragm is. Is the volume increasing or decreasing? Pressure increasing or decreasing? Where's the negative pressure? And air is always gonna to flow towards the negative pressure. Okay, here's a summary. Um, and then your rib cage, you know, can expand. You've got cartilage there, it expands and contracts or expands and kind of moves back in as you breathe as well. All right, so we're all done. Um, as always, it's been a blast. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, hit the hit the little bell on YouTube if you'd like to be notified when I make a new video. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions or if this made any sense at all. I miss you. <laughs>